Uh, thanks for showing up. I know it's late. There's two more talks uh, on GraphQL. Um, great day today. Uh, lots of great talks. Great talks on caching, too. Uh, here's another, another one. It's going to be a little different, though. We're going to talk about more of the philosophy and kind of trade-offs behind GraphQL and caching, what kind of things we hear about caching and GraphQL out there, and try to sort out this mess. Uh, sorry, clicker problems. Okay, perfect. Uh, so my name is Marc André. I work on the API team at GitHub, and Zach actually my fourth GraphQL summit. Usually uh, I gave some talks on how we do things at GitHub, but today is going to be a little, a little bit different, uh, but it sh it should be good still. I've been working hard the past year or two. I've been working on bridging this gap we have between the GraphQL community and the rest of the API community. So I've been kind of active on Twitter, looking at some rants I see, some battles between passionate GraphQL developers and the rest of the API community. And we have a lot to learn uh, as the GraphQL community from other API styles, what issues they faced over many, many years, so I definitely learned a lot of things from there, uh, but there's also some, an annoying side of that. That's something I saw a lot in the past, maybe like even four years since GraphQL was announced. Uh, statement, statement like this, uh, not many details about it, just statements like this. You can't cache GraphQL. Sometimes you wonder why people are so opinionated about some of these things. So I really decided to look into it further, try to see what do these people mean when they say you can't cache GraphQL, right? Because we saw many talks on it, announcements from Apollo on caching on a client, Apollo server, uh, so many different ways to cache. So where do these statements even come from? So I hope this talk is kind of a toolkit for you if you're excited about GraphQL at your company or talk about it publicly on how to face these statements and find the truth under these statements. So one thing we hear a lot is you can't do server-side caching with GraphQL. And to kind of de go deeper into that, I tried writing some caching server-side to see if that was actually impossible and something would attack me when I tried. Uh, this is GraphQL Ruby, my favorite GraphQL implementation. Uh, there's a name resolver here, and I tried caching name, and it turned out it worked. <laughs> um, so we can actually cache GraphQL on server side. In fact, on the server side, in our resolvers, we can do anything we want at this point, right? It's just, it's just code. We can do whatever we want. So at the application side, the server side, there's many great ways to cache, and usually that's going to be dictated by how your existing caching system at the company you work works. So maybe I thought it's, it's probably the clients. Uh, it's probably the clients that can cache. But as I said earlier, quickly you realize, in fact, there's so many, all these clients have amazing normalized caches. What you discover when you poke these people is what they're talking about is, is HTTP caching. Uh, so they know you can cache on the server side. They know you can cache on the client side. But it's the great HTTP specification uh, that involves caching that GraphQL completely ruins. To kind of understand what you mean by that, uh, I thought we'd maybe like go a little, uh, do a little prime on HTTP caching. So HTTP caching has two main concepts. One is freshness, the other one is validation. Freshness is a way for a server to give a resource to a client and instruct the client, you can keep this resource for X amount of seconds. Uh, before that, it's useless. It's probably, you probably have the right version of the resource. In practice, this is usually done through the HTTP header uh, cache control, here with a max age of 60 seconds in this example. Validation is a little different. At the end of the 60 seconds, if the client decides, oh, this resource is probably stale, I'm going to request it again from the server, well, there's a way for the server to say, mm, actually, you already have the valid version of that resource, I don't actually need to send it again. And that's validation. 
Uh, practically, this is actually done through the last modified header and the e-tag header on the server side. Last modified is simply a date and time uh, at which the resource was last modified. And e-tag is, kind of is kind of a token that indicates the state of that particular resource. The client can then use these values, for example, if, with a if modified since header, passing the date uh, and avoiding refetching is the, if the resource hasn't been modified since. With the e-tag, you get kind of an equivalent header that can be used if non-match. If that tag changed for the resource on the server side, I actually want it back, but if it's the same that I already have, I'll just don't send me anything, I'll keep it. So these are actually pretty great concepts that are used. They're very important, for example, for assets that browser downloads, very important. It's kind of a foundation of the web. So I agree it'd be pretty, it'd be pretty sad if we couldn't use it with GraphQL. But is that actually true? Can, can a GraphQL query like this actually not use any of the, these mechanisms? Well, we can actually. We can set a cache control header on a GraphQL query, right? Except while we, we're usually used to resources as being like one user or like one product or one friend, the resources we play with with GraphQL are query documents, right? One query document is kind of a resource here, which means we can totally attach cache control headers to it. And exact, in this example here, I'm querying the viewer, its name, friends, and maybe the server says you can actually keep that for an hour. Same thing with last modified. The field with the value of last modified that's the smallest here can generally be done to the whole query here, meaning we can attach that to a query document. As you can see, we can also use an e-tag. We can compile an e-tag entity tag for a whole query saying this query has that value, and a client could use that to avoid refetching something it already has. In fact, uh, in my researches, I saw that Apollo Server already lets you do that. It lets you annotate your schema even down to certain fields, and then at runtime, the HTTP server running the GraphQL engine will actually return the cache control header according to all these annotations you had in declaratives there. But even though that's possible in theory, the haters will say you can't actually use that because GraphQL uses the post HTTP verb, and you can't generally cache posts. But that's a myth also, right? In fact, the GraphQL specification doesn't tell us anything about which verb or even tell us to use HTTP in the first place. We can actually use any transport mechanism, any protocol we want. So why don't we use just get like this with a query in a query parameter? and simply use these cache control headers freely. There's another thing they'll come back at you with. Uh, they'll say, well, get parameters actually have size limits. So if you have a giant query, that might not work. That's where persisted queries come. If you haven't heard of persisted queries yet, uh, they're a pretty neat concept. So we have a client and server here, and Usually, a client will send a GraphQL document like this and expect to get back a response. That's kind of our standard GraphQL cycle. With persistent queries, we kind of change this. Instead of sending the whole query and expecting a response right away, we have a first step where a client will register a particular query with the server. The server can then say, OK, I got it this query, you're gonna use this query later, just take this identifier or even URL that you can simply call next time instead of passing the whole query. This gives us a few really awesome things. The first thing is if you have queries that are so large that don't fit in a get query parameter, well, you actually save these bytes over the wire every time you call it, right? Because right now it's just a new URL and the server holds the whole query document. The other thing is you skip validation, any analysis, anything you run on a query document every time. Well, at query registration time, you can actually do that. Finally, it actually lets us use HTTP caching because basically here we're using just an HTTP API, right? We're just calling a resource and expecting back a response. So at this point, Maybe we'll even get laughed at. Why don't you just use a standard HTTP API instead of using GraphQL? You're just calling endpoints at this point. 
But it's more nuanced than that, right? We're not exactly just using HTTP API. We're using it in a way where clients actually generated their server-side resources, which allows possibly thousands of different clients to register their own little custom endpoint, which is a thing that back in the days and even today, um, people have to do, right? Create a bunch of little custom endpoints for each client, use special query parameters to define custom responses. So that thing is happening in typical HTTP endpoints, except this time we're actually redefining that border where the server teams don't have to respond to every single use case, write a new endpoint, manage the complexity. It's actually driven by the clients. However, I have some bad news. It's true that GraphQL is actually kind of hard to cache, even though we can use HTTP caching, we can use server-side caching, and we can use client-side caching. That example might, might make it a little bit more clear. Um, we had the cache control header to a query document before, and that's all good. Uh, we can cache for an hour. Maybe friends don't change often, and the name of the user doesn't either. If the same client then requests, maybe on another page or later in the, um, on the page, the same kind of query, but this time, actually, I want not only the friends, but the events. In that case, events is something that is actually quite volatile. Uh, maybe uh, events are getting updated frequently, maybe new events are added, which means the cache control header can't say one hour anymore because we're expecting events to change. Maybe now we're back to 60 seconds. But it's kind of sad, right? Because the friends and name, they basically never change. And just because we requested a little bit more data, now we're paying the cost for everything. Same thing with e-tags. This query could be represented with an e-tag, could be cached for many clients to use. But we add simply a little field, and the whole thing needs to change. It can't have the same cache key. And a good example of that is even white spaces could cause such issues. So smart GraphQL caches usually normalize that, remove white spaces. But definitely adding a field here would break our cache. But the real question here is that, is this actually really specific to GraphQL? Is it the fact that it's named GraphQL that we can't cache? And not really, right? The, the real thing is that we're using different API styles, and API styles make different trade-offs. And there's kind of a customization to optimization spectrum, and every API style falls differently on that. The more optimized API styles are, usually the way easier there is to cache, right? Because they have one single way of doing things without much flexibility, and you can cache that for a lot of clients. So your typical RPC, maybe even gRPC, is usually very optimized for these kind of things. Then you'll have REST. If you have a very fine-grained REST with hypermedia linked into other resources, generally very good in terms of cacheability. But then we dive into more flexibility, right, which is absolutely great for the reasons we hear a lot when we talk about GraphQL. You have things like response partials. We talked a, bit a little earlier about the custom endpoints, trying to fit different use cases, which every time you add one, every time you add one query parameter, you're making caching a little bit harder to do. Then you even have things like complex field filters, even kind of reinventing GraphQL within a query parameter on an endpoint sometimes. Finally, we have GraphQL, which takes a strong stance on the flexibility side, right? And there's many other examples. This is OData, which is quite a flexible approach. It's not necessarily very easy to cache either. JSON API specification for uh, HTTP APIs in JSON allows you to include nested resources, filter on fields you select, very close to GraphQL, right? Which also makes caching a bit less efficient in these cases. Even have some certain REST styles which allow you to embed different resources on certain resources, meaning the more different embeds you have, the more things can change and dilute your cache. So there is one thing that makes it harder to cache GraphQL, but it's actually a thing in any API that wants to be flexible. And does GraphQL know about this trade-off? Of course, that's the whole point, right? We wanted flexibility, so we gave away 
a few things. But it doesn't mean we just can't cache. It just means we've left a bit of the cache power on the side to have more of that flexibility. So at this point, your haters might try other techniques. They might say, well, still, all the proxy middleware public caches that HTTP gives us, you're, with all this flexibility, you're just going to ruin it for everyone. You're, you're just going to destroy the internet. And this one shocked me at first. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe they're right. So I went in the ancient text of the uh, HTTP spec, and I found something pretty funny. Um, public caches, proxy caches on the internet, can't cache anything that contains the authorization header, which makes sense, because you don't want a public cache to cache user-specific stuff. But weirdly enough, that's never something any of the people you see on Twitter saying you can't cache GraphQL talk about. A lot of us have authorized APIs, and Facebook, who invented GraphQL, had an authorized API, which makes a lot of sense. So that small little snippet of text is quite useful if you have an authorized API, are happy with GraphQL, and you hear things like, you're breaking the internet, uh, you can use that. So, we can't cache server-side GraphQL, that's not true. We can't cache client-side GraphQL, that's not true either. We can't use HTTP caching with GraphQL, that's not true either. In fact, GraphQL is cacheable, it is very cacheable. And caching with GraphQL can be a little less effective than we highly optimized APIs as we saw because of that flexibility it provides. And that flexibility is what allows us to support thousands of clients at GitHub, a lot, a lot of use cases that we would need to tweak REST API endpoints, create new endpoints, create one of these query parameter filters, we can do with GraphQL at low cost on the server side. So it's not a mistake that GraphQL forgot, like, oh, we forgot about caching, we ruined everything. It's actually a trade-off we're making. And this brings me to nuance, trade-offs, and context, which I think in all of these discussions, a lot of things we read, and that's not only on the, the rest of the API community, that's also in our community. A lot of posts we read, they lack these three words often, uh, because GraphQL is not necessarily the greatest thing for everything, but it works very well at certain use cases, and we can acknowledge that maybe it's not the most cacheable thing ever, but we can pragmatically use caching when it helps us. So GraphQL might not be a sweet spot for any static, public, unauthenticated use cases. If you have a JavaScript asset you want to serve for your browser, maybe GraphQL is not the best choice, but I don't see many people doing that so far. If you have an authenticated API with volatile data, that you can't even cache for more than a few seconds anyway, and you enjoy GraphQL, and it makes your client-side experience better, it lets you handle many use cases on the server side, well, consider the trade-off we talked about, but don't worry too much. That's it for me. Thanks. <laughs>